Biden and Putin sit down in Switzerland. When was COVID first circulating in the U.S.? And just how many streaming services are people willing to sign up for? We may have an answer. Wednesday Need to Know, let's go. Good morning, this is Cheddar's Need to Know podcast for Wednesday, June 16th. I'm Jill Wagner with Carlo Versano. Hey, Carlo. Good morning, Jill. I'm feeling very good this morning. Uh, I think we discovered a new parenting life hack yesterday. Tell me everything. That, uh, it's, um, there's a YouTube video that's just eight hours of a vacuum cleaner going back and forth. And we just put that thing on full blast on the TV yesterday, and she was just cool as a cucumber. She loved it. <laughs> and I was I was reading that apparently, I mean, I guess it makes sense, right? Because that sort of like simulates the the sounds that were in the womb. That I guess newborns just love that stuff. So she, hopefully that was not a one day thing, and that's uh, that's going to be a new thing here. So I'm guessing you didn't read Happiest Baby on the Block by Doctor. I think no, it's Harvey I think we did. Carp. You did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's his oh, whole theory. Oh, and we theory. watched the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's we his whole theory that you that that's the swaddling. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. But that's that the guy's... whole idea that um, that they like that kind of white noise because it's yeah. very similar to what was in the womb uh, and it makes them feel comfortable. So yeah, or uh, good. I'm glad that that worked out for you guys, <laughs> it and feels especially so good, on your first it? day back. What? Doesn't it feel so good? Doesn't it feel so good when you have when you have a little win like that? Oh, any little secret that you're like, oh my God, this works, uh, is the best yeah. thing ever. I just wanted to <laughs> do a quick note before we start. Um, I'm going to be on a panel tomorrow talking about the rise in anti-Semitism and what we could do about it. It is at noon tomorrow. It's organized by this great group called Feely. Uh, the other panelists are just really impressive a lot more impressive than i am so it's going to be it's going to be really good i think uh not political at all it's just really about anti-semitism uh the whole thing is free it's going to run about 45 minutes possibly an hour because they're going to do some questions but if you're interested i've got the link to sign up uh, on my instagram bio uh, my instagram handle is jill r wagner you could email me as well jill at cheddar.com and i will send you the link um, and if you can't make it live right i believe if there's going to be it's going to run on youtube as well they're going to have yeah. a link up it's so a live could, stream uh it's a live stream yes we're yeah. still not yeah, ready yeah. to do in-person events it's all going to be okay, virtual cool. but there's going to be they're going to post it on youtube so if you're interested I, i'm happy to send you the link once it's up on youtube as well awesome tomorrow at noon uh, all right, let's get to the, the big news here. President Biden's much anticipated summit with Vladimir Putin taking place this morning in Geneva, moments from when we're recording this. So it's 6.30 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, so that's going to happen relatively soon. On the agenda, cyber weapons, nukes, and climate change. The two world leaders are going to be holding separate solo press conferences after they meet instead of one joint presser. Uh, which the R Russians reportedly wanted. The White House denied that request. They don't want to give Putin this platform uh, to be side by side with the U.S. president like we saw uh, back in Helsinki right. with President, former President Trump. I think that's a good move, probably. Biden said at the G7 earlier this week that his main goal for this thing today is conveying to Putin that the cyber warfare has got to stop. Uh, that's what really this whole thing about, it, this whole thing is about. There's a good analysis in the New York Times this morning about how these summits used to be all about nuclear pro proliferation, and obviously that's still a big concern, but the biggest thing now is cyber warfare and cyber weapons and hacking. Um, because the fact is nobody really knows what to do about it. This sort of like grinding, low-grade, new form of warfare, it doesn't really have a body count, at least not yet, but it still inflicts serious damage on the economy and just on, on you know, people's well-being. Um, and the question is, how do you deter it? When it was about, when it was about nukes, there was the concept of MAD, right? Mutually assured destruction. You nuke us, we're going to nuke you right back. It's game over for everybody, right? That theory is the reason why we're alive right now, right? And why anyone in the world has been alive for the last 70 years. But you can't really apply that uh, to cyber warfare, or at least they haven't figured out how. So I'll be curious to see if any news comes out on the cyber warfare front. But again, I think that these things, like I said yesterday, I don't expect there to be too much news, and you're not going to get the visual of these two guys standing at podium side by side. So here's what we know is going to happen in terms mm -hmm. of just the logistics of this. They're not yep. going to meet alone at any point. So you're not going to have Biden and Putin by themselves together. Uh, so first, Biden and Putin are going to meet with Secretary of State Antony Blinken and then his Russian counterpart. So that will be four of mm -hmm. them meeting. After that, they're going to meet with other officials. Um, 
And Biden asked for this meeting. So if you're wondering kind of like how this came about, Biden is the one who proposed this. And that's why mm -hmm. a lot of analysts say, you know, Putin already won because all he really needs to do is show up here. Um, right. And it kind of has already given him a little bit of validity. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see what comes of it. Um, if anything at all, the bar, I think, is, is pretty low. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Putin did win just by virtue of being having, you know, the, the U.S. networks going up live with it, it just it, it puts him on the same plane as us, which is what what you're saying. A lot of people are just like, why even bother? Right. So one thing I've heard this morning that I think is pretty wild. It's not surprising, but it's a little shocking. Did you know that? So just say they have in Russia, they have Twitter, Facebook, they have social media, news media. Do you know that everything has to first go through kind of like this, like it has to go through the government first. Everything is yeah. funneled through the government. So all of the news, all of the information, anything they read on the Internet, it is all getting funneled right. through the government. Uh, so there's just, I mean, we, we have our own issues here with misinformation and disinformation. <laughs> and and yeah. I'm not that we're the model for anything, but that is <laughs> right. uh, really. It's a whole other ball game. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah, just, uh, you're, that is like there is no way to find out actually what's going on in the world. Right. Which is why he has like a, you know, 60 <laughs> Which is why he keeps payment. winning with like 96 <laughs> yeah. percentage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Um, also breaking overnight, the Israeli military had to uh, conduct airstrikes in Gaza after Hamas launched what uh, they're calling incendiary balloons into southern Israel. I don't know if you've seen this video, Carlo, but Hamas actually posted mm -hmm. video of this. These balloons look like regular balloons, like almost like balloons you would see at a kid's birthday party. Um, right. But they are filled with a gas that's triggered to ignite while they're in the air. So they've caused fires in Israel, um, damage to, to the crops and property. At this point, though, no immediate reports of casualties on either side. Um, but these strikes, the first since a very fragile ceasefire, um, ended that latest conflict between Israel and Hamas last month. And it also comes just days into Israel's new coalition government. Yeah, we didn't get to a chance to really talk about that because I guess I was off. Um, but uh, big news over there with BB out. Uh, but the, anyway, that's old news. But according to the Associated Press in Jerusalem, uh, the spark of violence started after uh, the Israeli government, the, this new coalition government, allowed a group of far-right Israelis to march through some Palestinian areas of East Jerusalem. Uh, Hamas had said it would retaliate, and it did. Uh, and here we are. So hopefully this is just a spasm of, and not sort of like a sign of this, uh, this truce coming apart. That's right. Hamas had been calling for a, a day of rage. And as you said, hopefully just just a flare up and not the start of, of another war. Uh, back here in the U.S., a day after California reopened, New York has now dropped most of its remaining pandemic restrictions amid plummeting case numbers and rising vaccination rates. Both California and New York now have 70 plus percent of their populations at least partially vaccinated, though there are places in each state where the rate is far lower. Uh, where you are in Brooklyn, Carlo, it's just 41%. For example, there are zip codes though in San Bernardino Valley that are in the low single digits, but it is a, a pretty big moment for these two states that were the original epicenters. Uh, there were fireworks across New York last night to celebrate. On the order of Governor Cuomo in California, they're giving away 15 million bucks to 10 lucky vaccinated residents. It's funny, right? Because Newsom and Cuomo have all of these political problems. So both of these guys are just going whole hog. <laughs> yeah. Turn it right. These are Party. Like, these, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Forget about all this other stuff that we did. Um, but look, it's, it, it's great. I do think it's notable that so many business because one of the at least in New York, I, I don't know if this is the case in California, though, I suspect it is the 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 the, the sort of um, stipulation here is that businesses can still pretty much do whatever they want, right? So businesses can still put in mask mandates. They can do social distancing if, if they so choose. I do think it's notable that so many businesses, small businesses in places like New York and California, with positivity rates now below, significantly below 1%, are still requiring workers to wear masks. I, I, you know, it's one thing I think to make customers still wear them. It, it's sort of annoying at this point, but whatever. It is what it is. I can handle it. But it is sort of another thing to make like the fry cook or the barista do it at this point when they're almost are very likely to have been vaccinated. You know, wearing a mask for eight or 10 hours a day, it sucks. It really sucks, especially when it's hot. Uh, especially when it's in like a hot kitchen. Um, and it's now really just sort of theater to make people feel 
sort of safer, even though people are vaccinated. It doesn't matter if the fry cook is wearing a mask or not if you're vaccinated. So I just I'm curious, where are all the liberals who proclaim to be all about the working class on this issue? Because I haven't heard a peep from anybody about this. Maybe it's just me. Uh, there's also some more evidence that COVID was circulating undetected in the United States as early as December of 2019, weeks before the first infections were confirmed. A new government report found a person in Illinois had tested positive for antibodies on January 7th, 2020. So we know that these antibodies take a couple of weeks to develop. So that suggests the virus was in Illinois around Christmas of 2019. Several other samples from a handful of other states around the country were positive for antibodies also at around that time. So the bottom line, as we know, COVID was here for at least a month uh, before anybody yeah. knew it. The first confirmed COVID case in the U.S. January 20th of last year. Community spread was not confirmed until late uh, February. So look, hindsight, yada, 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 right? Uh, you know, if we knew then what we knew now. But just, uh, you know, just imagine if somehow, if some little bird just told us in those crucial first six weeks of 2020, what was going on, like how many lives could have been saved? We'll never know the answer to that. Um, it's just so sad to think about, right? The, that precious early weeks of 2020 that we lost as we were just sort of diddling around here. And I was making fun of you for going to Home Depot and buying masks. <laughs> and we were like, oh, it's just the flu. How bad could it be? It's not coming here. Well, because and the other thing is, too, I mean, it goes without saying, but the reason that the knowledge of this was important is, is when we talk, we were able in the beginning anyway to trace the virus to just a handful of people. Um, and there was a guy in, in Westchester who was sick yeah. with a cough who thought it was just like pneumonia or something. And he was taking the train. He was going yeah. to Grand Central Station, um, commuting every day. Uh, could you imagine? I mean, just he would have known to have looked for that. His doctors yeah. would have known to have looked for that. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, that that's the tragedy of this as we go back and think about was it preventable? I don't know, right? I mean, you you can only do so no, it, much, but yeah, certainly it was, it wasn't many of the deaths were preventable. Yeah, it's just it was all information. If we just had known more, the good news, I guess you could say, is that if this if and when this happens again, we have so much more of a knowledge base built up now about this, about respiratory viruses in general, that we won't make some of the same mistakes, God willing. Oh, we will. Uh, the Delta yeah, variant, by the way, the Delta variant, the one that was first um, yeah. found in India, that is nasty. I don't know if you've heard yeah. about some of these infection yeah. rates. They're like, it's like 60% more transmissible. Um, so if you're not vaccinated and you're around somebody with that virus for, for really just a short period of time, you will likely get yeah. it, um, which is why what we saw in India, why that, that country was just decimated from this, because um, that variant yeah. is so severe. The good so news is the vaccines appear to be working, yes. appear to be working against it. All the more reason to get vaccinated. <laughs> We're so annoying. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay, some relevant economic data uh, here related to the pandemic. Retail sales actually declined in May after soaring through uh, throughout the late winter and early spring. It's a sign that people are perhaps changing their spending habits as the pandemic recedes. So sales for things like electronics, furniture, cars, all fell from the month prior, while sales of clothes and purchases at restaurants and bars went up dramatically. Clothing sales actually up 200% from the same time last year when we were all pretty much in sweatpants forever mode. <laughs> and this gave a much needed boost to the struggling department store industry. It makes sense. You know, there's only so much redecorating you can do. There's only so much uh, home improvements you can make, right? You can't get a dishwasher every month. Uh, and now restaurants and bars are open, so spending more out there. That's fantastic because uh, those places need it. They need it much more than Home Depot or Lowe's need it. Uh, retail sales reports, importantly uh, to note here, they don't include spending on travel and lodging. Um, so it's hard, to, it's hard to tell how that's going. But we do know from credit card data from MasterCard uh, showing that those sectors are seeing big, much-needed increases there. Um, um, it seems I don't know. I don't spend a lot of time on social media, um, but it seems to me like everyone and their mother is either planning a big vacation or on a big vacation. So the FOMO, the FOMO is out in, in force this summer. The problem is, though, is inflation. And Baker and I talked about this a little bit last week, but things mm -hmm. are just costing so much more. And, and then there's things Have you, you tried just to take an Uber. No, I haven't. I haven't taken an Uber. Is it is it wild? It's well, it's, I've, we took one to the hospital uh, when Becky went into labor, which is uh, like, I don't know, 
10 feet from our house basically and it was like $20 which it, you know probably should have been like six but my friend Carl sent me a screenshot of his Uber from Kennedy Airport to Brooklyn it was more than his flight home to Minnesota it was like $200 it's, it's crazy. nuts um, and that's <clears throat> we're we're in the market for a car uh, a new car mm. and it, we can't even get one yeah, because everything's back ordered and and just so expensive so I'm driving my in-laws extra car um thank god and and so i'm yeah. i'm driving basically around my in-laws car at this point um <laughs> and that's where we are i mean there, you if you want to order furniture or anything like that it's like a, a months long wait yeah. in, for the most part um and everything's just so expensive and a lot of economists kind of poo-poo it there's a big fed meeting that's going on um there where jerome Today, powell think, this yeah. afternoon is going to be talking about interest rates and things about the economy um, but there's no way, there's no way other way to look at it. If you pay for anything, you know, it just costs more to exist in this world right now. If you go grocery shopping, yep. pay a bill, uh, fill up your tank with gas. It, it's just, everything is really expensive. Um, yep. and, and when you talk about retail spending, that's less money to spend on other things. Absolutely. Look, it's a big, uh, it's a big political risk for Biden. I think for sure. I, my gut tells me that it, it's going to start to sort of, I think I've said this before, but it's going to start to look, it doesn't really matter. Like if a, if a gallon of milk costs six bucks instead of four bucks, like that's two less dollars that you have. Like you said, I just think it's like, you're seeing like these, these lurches of like the economy. It's like a, you know, it's like that scene in Titanic when like they go into like the bowels of the ship and, and, the, they're, and they're starting to get the thing moving and like the pistons are firing and they're putting the coal in the fires. I don't know. Maybe that's stupid, but it, it, that's sort of like how the economy is right now. Right. Like it's, it's lurching back and everything's all messed up. I don't know. I just don't. I, it feels like everyone's dismissing it. And I, I don't know. I feel it personally every time yeah. I go food shopping. And, and I, I just think everyone says it's very transitory. It's going to be a couple months. OK, well, you guys said that like a couple months ago and a couple months before right. that. And it's getting worse. Um, speaking of money, Mackenzie Scott has <laughs> announced that she is giving away another two point seven billion dollars to two hundred and eighty six charitable organizations on top of the roughly six billion dollars that she donated to various groups in 2020. Scott, if you remember, the ex-wife of Jeff Bezos, who is now married to a Seattle teacher named Dan Jewett. So she's been pledging to give away her fortune, which is estimated at around 60 billion dollars, quote, until the safe is empty. Meanwhile, her ex-husband is planning like the world's biggest vanity project in the coming weeks by going to space. That's that's <laughs> happening. When's, when's that happening? Next month? That's going to be <laughs> wild, right? Um, still, though, what's interesting here is despite this remarkable pace of her donations, and I, you have to give her credit because it, it's not easy, I don't think, to give away $3 billion just like that. Uh, but her fortune is still going up. Why is that? Of course, because her fortune is an Amazon stock, which is through the roof. Uh, so just think about that. When you're that rich... You literally cannot give your way, your money away fast enough, which I think just says something about the sort of like new gilded age that we're living in. And, you know, Scott, to her credit and sort of as opposed to her ex-husband, she's been very vocal about that and about the wealth gap and actually has been said that she she doesn't want to leave her money around. She wants to give it away faster than it accrues, but she just can't because it's accruing so fast. That's crazy. Um, and right. we may finally know the answer to one of the biggest questions in media. Just how many streaming services are people willing to manage or at least pay for? This is OK. The answer is seven, which is a lot higher <laughs> than I thought it was going to be. According to yeah, a new too. consumer research report, the average number of video streaming platforms used per American, both paid and free, has actually declined um, from 7.23 in November to 7.06 in April. A different story overseas, the number of services per home continues to climb. I always thought the, the going number that we were, the consensus number was three, that, that yeah. ultimately Americans would settle for paying for three. Yeah, I yeah, know yeah. that this includes free services as well. Right. Um, so that changes, I, I think that changes I think the formula. I think that's why it's higher than you think, because I think I pay for Netflix, I think Becky pays for Hulu and maybe one more. I don't know. But yeah, but there's but all sorts of other ones. that's also the funny part is that so many people have, like, there's, I have one, my husband has one. Yeah. There's, there's remnants of our single lives. If you're of a certain age, your streaming <laughs> totally. service is a remnant of your single life. And they're like the one thing that's not joint. We still have one of my husband's friends. We still have him. We have his Netflix oh, yeah. account and he has our Amazon account. And every once in a while I'll turn it on. I'm like, who was watching this? Oh, and yeah. My husband's like, Adam, <laughs> Adam was doing my, it. Like, great. My, be my best friend from high school uses my dad's <laughs> HBO Max. It's like, 
<laughs> I don't even think he knows that. Crazy. Um, I, I, look, I think a lot of this has to do with habits changing, right? People are out more. They're probably watching a little bit t less TV. But I think it also shows, and we've talked about this, Jill, right? People aren't really wedded to these platforms the way you would be to a cable bundle, right? You get a cable bundle. That's just like – that's the cable that you have for – like I think my parents have probably had the same cable bundle for the last 30 years, right? It's just you don't, you don't change that uh, unless you're cutting the cord. But we subscribe and unsubscribe and resubscribe to Apple TV Plus I think like three times probably. You know, you dip in when there's a show you want to watch and then you cancel it and then you sort of resubscribe when that show comes back. So it's interesting. It's sort of like a new way of, of consuming this content. Um, I'm curious if other people – if other people do that. Maybe we're the, the weirdos. But like I don't want to pay for something if I'm just not watching anything on it, right? Well, and it's easy enough to do. The reason you don't cut the cord, you only yeah, do right. it once or not, it's because you, you have to get someone to your house. It's, it's a production. You have to return the cable boxes. It's not as easy as basically just saying, all right, I'm going to unsubscribe exactly. and then resubscribe. There's no penalty um, or anything right. like that. So, so why not? Um, okay, guys, before we go, quick sh quick birthday shout out. First of all, happy birthday to my sister, Lexi. Also, shout out to Kelsey. It's her 30th birthday. She and her sister, Kara, claim to be Need to Know's number one fans. They say that they've listened to every single episode since we started. <laughs> I don't know if we can. I don't know if we can confirm that, but we'll we'll give them the. <laughs> we're gonna uh, have a quiz. <laughs> we're gonna have a quiz. Yeah. <laughs> um, if we had a swag budget, guys, we'd send you something, but we don't. Uh, so instead, we'll just say best birthday wishes to you, Kelsey. Wouldn't it be fun if we had need to know cheddar, need to know hats, or or like mugs oh, yeah. or something like that, even a sticker. Um, anyway, a happy birthday, Kelsey, fellow Gemini. We're a fun, quirky bunch. Uh, enjoy, <laughs> enjoy the day. Francesca's a Gemini too. You guys are pretty good. Ah, yeah, I yes, we're very. By the way, I think the third. I think your thirties um, are much better than than your twenties. That's just. Yeah. We, we don't have time to debate it now, but I'll just say <laughs> that because I remember turning thirty and I was a little depressed, and somebody said yeah. to me, "They're like, no, no, no. The twenties, you're insecure. You don't know what's going on. Thirties, you're a little bit more." established yeah. you feel you more comfortable in your own skin and obviously this is very this is everybody's life is different and everyone has their own experiences but that made me feel better i like that yeah so far so good um okay that's what you need to know for wednesday june 16th have a good one guys